your blood we praise you jesus we exalt you jesus you are worthy of it all we give you the highest praise in jesus name we pray amen Good evening. It's wonderful to be back again on a Saturday evening. I'm always excited about Saturdays. The reason being that in the presence of God, one should always expect miracles because God never comes empty-handed to his people. He always comes down to bless his people. And this evening I've titled my message Living in His Presence. When we talk about the presence of the Lord, there are different aspects to this. There is the omnipresence of God that says that God is everywhere. There is the indwelling presence of, the, of God within the, within the spirit of a believer. The spirit of God rests. And that is the indwelling spirit of God. And then we have the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence of God is the very presence of God that comes into the midst of of a, of, a, of a group of people or in the life of a person to do, to do something special and spectacular. And even this evening, we are going to be looking at different inc incidents in the Bible that, ta that has taken place that shows us the different aspects, the different workings of God. God always desires the fellowship of his people. He's a God who longs to spend time with his children. And we see this in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 8. At the very beginning, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, it says in verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. It's God who literally has left heaven and has come down to walk and to fellowship with both Adam and Eve. And... It seems like this was his practice that in the cool of the evening he would come and sit to talk. But many times we are not comfortable in his presence when there is sin in our lives, when there's guilt and shame and when things are not right between us and God. We are not happy to be in his presence. And so also it was with Adam and Eve. That when they saw God, it says they hid themselves with the, in the present, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden because they were not right with God. And here when we talk about the presence of God in the Old Testament, we have this wonderful name of Jehovah that says Jehovah Shama the Lord is there God always wanted to rest with his people and when God is in the midst of his people his very glory comes down and everything in our lives are transformed just like it was in the time in, in the Old Testament times in Israel when God was in the midst of them 
nobody could hide his presence nobody could hide his glory the nations around knew that there was something different about israel and they trembled and they were afraid in the book of ezekiel we read that the name of the city that is jerusalem that day shall be the lord is there even in the end times even during the time of the old testament times god was very much part of his people dwelling in the midst of them in the temple in the holy of holies his presence dwelt in the ark of the covenant between the cherubims the presence of god could be found and even today you and i are his temple and you and i carry his presence in the book of, in the god in the book of 1 corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 it says do you not know that you are the temple of god and that the spirit of god dwells in you when we talk about the omnipresence of god it speaks about god being everywhere and no creature can hide from his presence but when we talk about the indwelling presence of god it speaks about like i told you the very spirit of god resting in you and me because you and i are the temple and even in this uh, epistle we we do we read that do you not know that you are the temple of god you and i are the temple of god if you just sit back and let this this great truth just sink in the temple was something that was very very much in a, in a in an israeli or in a hebrew's mind the temple represented the presence and today you, we need to know that as believers, as New Testament believers who are blood washed and, who's, and who believe in Christ and the Spirit of God rests in you and I, we carry the same glory, the same glory that was there in the temple. But unfortunately our spiritual eyes are not open and we don't understand these deep truths about ourselves otherwise jesus going on the cross would would actually it's actually a vain thing but when jesus died on the cross he gave us a package deal not just our sins being washed not just our sicknesses being healed not just about eternal life and life after death it was much more than that it spoke about a new relationship between god and man and the reason that jesus came was because god wanted to repair that fractured relationship that happened in the garden of eden and he wanted us to enjoy his presence and he wants to enjoy your presence and we need to understand that us carrying his presence means that we need to live differently we need to see god differently we need to see ourselves differently the enemy has kept our eyes closed for too long he's kept us blinded it's always poor me who cannot get anything done nothing's really happening for poor me where he's minimized you and he's also minimized your faith in god and he's also minimized your vision of who god really is The Bible talks about the presence of the Lord. When the presence of the Lord comes, the mountains will melt like wax in his presence. And the whole earth will be silent when they see the glory of God moving over the earth. Colossians 1.27 says, to them God will to make known that are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This was a mystery. This indwelling 
presence of God is actually a mystery to Old Testament believers. The Old Testament people could not believe that, that God's glory could live inside of man. Because they always saw God's glory in connection with the Ark of the Covenant. In the very Holy of Holies. But when Jesus died and he said it is finished and when the curtain was torn into two, it showed man, showed us that man could walk into the very presence of a holy God. That is why one of the names of, of, that was given uh, to Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. God no more behind the temple, behind a curtain. God no more hidden. But God who is with us, God who dwells within us, and this is our hope, the hope of glory, otherwise you and I are nothing, just matter, just flesh and blood, even, uh, even our minds are very senseless and futile, and even our greatest intelligence is foolishness before God. But God, when he put his spirit within you and me, he said, this is your glory, that the, that the presence, that the spirit of almighty God dwells within man and man is transformed and man's situations are transformed, man's circumstances are transformed and you and I need to walk with that understanding, not living below the bar. Not living uh, defeated lives. Not living in depression or anxiety or fear or worry. I'm not saying that these things do not bombard our minds. Yes. But when that happens, that's the time for us to really readjust and have a reset. And look into the face of Christ. That says that you are co-heirs with him. Heirs of God. Seated in heavenly places with him. And when I, when I ask you, what are these heavenly places? We walk in a different realm. We walk in a spiritual realm. We are 100% human beings. But yet within us, we are fueled by the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. We are fueled by the glory of the living God. And this pulls us upward. This is the upward call for us to walk differently, think differently, speak differently, hope differently. We can believe in miracles because we believe in God. If there is no God, there are no miracles. There is no hope. You and I will just be creatures of, of just circumstances. But when we have God in our lives, everything changes. We are creatures of destiny. That, and God has great, great purposes for you and me. This Holy Spirit that God has put upon us is a guarantee for you and for me. That we have been set apart for salvation. That salvation is our portion. Because he has put a deposit within us. And that is his spirit, which is the very spirit of almighty God. That is why in the gospel of John, we are told, I mean, Jesus, when he looked at his, looked at his disciples and looked at his people, he said, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He said, just like I am not of the world, the same way you also are not of this world. Yes, we are. We may be bound by the laws of, of this world like other human beings. But most times because our minds are so governed by the things that we see. We cannot see beyond that. And that is what actually keeps us like Horses that, that, are, that, are, that, that have uh, shields for their eyes on either side. So they cannot look this way or that way. They are forced to just look in one direction. And we just look in one direction that is the physical world. We do not see ourselves as mighty spirit beings. Because inside of us dwells the very spirit of God. The Bible tells us that the spirit 
the power that brought Jesus Christ from the dead back to life is working in your life and my life, quickening your mortal body and quickening my mortal body, changing your circumstances and changing my circumstances. The resurrection power of Jesus is working constantly in our eyes, in, in our lives. We may not see it with our eyes, but it's happening and you will see it. When astonishing, astounding things happen in your life. I know because I have been a recipient of so many of his miracles. Things that I cannot imagine have happened. It has happened because of the power of God. That's working in our lives. The resurrection power of God. The call, the God, the spirit that is constantly lifting us up. God always made a difference between his people and the people who do not belong to him. Just like we read now in the, in the gospel of John uh, chapter 17 verse 16. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. That means you and I are not of this world just like Jesus was not of this world. And Jesus said when he did, when he did all those great miracles... He said, these things you shall do and greater things than these you shall do because I go to be with the Father. Because now Jesus is on the right hand of God, making intercession for us, praying powerful prayers for you and me constantly. And because we are the recipient of, these, of his intercessions, of him praying, of him pleading for you and me on the right hand of God, great things will happen and have happened in our lives. And therefore we are called to walk differently in this world. In the book of Exodus chapter 9 verse 26, God made a difference between the, the Egyptians and the Hebrews. Things were different in Egypt. Things were different in Goshen where the Israelites lived. Verse 26 says, Only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. Because when the hail came, it destroyed men, it destroyed beasts, it destroyed livestock, it destroyed uh, crops. Everything was destroyed for the Egyptians. But for the, for the Israelites, nothing was destroyed and everything was kept safe because there was no hail. God didn't allow the hail to come into their territory. Because God constantly always wants to and will make a distinction between his people and the people of this world. The people who are his children, who are his sheep, who, are, who belong to his, his kingdom will and must expect to live differently. Whereas the people of the world are orphans. They don't have a father like you and I have. Yet God in his goodness sends sunshine and rain upon the good and the evil. But yet you and I get preferential treatment and we live in his favor. And today I'm going to tell you, show you how you and I can live in that favor, that you and I can live in that presence so that we can be the recipients of his goodness and his blessings. Exodus 13, chapter 13 verses 21 and 22 also says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Here, when God led them in the wilderness, he did not leave them desolate. He was very much, pre very much present in the Israeli camp. During the day, he was a pillar of cloud. He led them. He showed them the way. If any of you have gone into a desert, 
you you will understand that you need help there's no way that in a desert you can find your way because the de the desert is just miles and miles and miles of sand there are there's nothing that can direct you and and it's very easy for people to get lost therefore the word of god tells us that he was a he was a pillar by day to lead the way to show them which way to go so that they would not just be going round and round and round in the wilderness and by night night time again in the desert can get very cold and it's very very dark and there was god's presence a pillar of fire to give them light he was very much with them the nations around knew that israel was different because they had heard stories about how god had delivered them out of the mighty hand of pharaoh by doing great signs and wonders and and bringing plagues and judgment upon the people of egypt because they had dared to keep his people captive now all the nations knew that he had led them through the red sea where the water stood on either side like a wall and they walked on dry ground but their enemies went down under when they tried to follow them and bring them harm and here again he was there in the wilderness showing them the way to go watching over them and being their light in the darkness and even today we worship that same god he has not changed one bit he wants to be that pillar of strength by you by your side he wants to lead you in everything that you do he wants to counsel you and guide you and show you the way that you must go but very many of us we lose out on this because we don't even ask him to come into our lives many of us live we believers live prayerless lives lives where months go when we when we haven't taken off the dust shaken off the dust from our bibles and looked in to to see what god is speaking to us and when things go wrong we try to hang the blame on him when you and i are the ones to be blamed because we never sought his face we never asked him we just did things our own way God had a different has a different role for his people. His role for you and me is in the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. He says, "You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden." This is the kind of person he wants you and me to be. A light in the darkness. Whenever you when when you've driven down a highway have you ever looked at a city on a hill for miles on end you can see that city because that city cannot be hidden and god doesn't want you and i to live in obscurity in shame in sorrow in heartache in depression in anxiety in fear in worry living below the bar that's not what he is called his children to be he wants you and i to be history makers to write history to showcase his glory to show him as alive in our lives today he's got you and me to carry his presence like the, like the ark of the covenant you and i are like the ark of the covenant that is why today we don't have an ark of the covenant anymore where we need to go and stand and worship no the presence of the lord dwells in you and me but many of us are blind and i'm going to read a story of how there there how there was a time when god opened the eyes of someone so that they could see 
into the spiritual realm just like I we need to pray sometimes and ask the Lord Lord show me Lord I'm so blind I can't see beyond my nose all I can see is this trouble Lord all I can see is heartache and and defeat Lord God I'm afraid Lord open my eyes and show me let me see things the way that you want me to see it in the in the book of second Kings verses uh, I mean chapter 6 verse 15 to 17 it's a story of the of the Assyrian the Syrian king he sends his army to come and and uh, capture Elisha because all his strategies were known to the king of Israel and he was wondering who's the one who's telling the king everything and then he was told don't you know that Elisha the prophet God reveals everything to him the things that you speak in your bedroom Elisha knows and he, and the Syrian king wanted to come in and seize Elisha and take him maybe take him and and put him in prison and here in verse 15 so there is Elisha and the Syrian army is surrounding him and his servant and verse 15 says and when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots and his servant said to him alas my master what shall we do so he answered do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them and Elisha prayed and said Lord I pray open the eyes open his eyes that he may see then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man that is a servant of Elisha and he saw and behold the mountain was full of, of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha how often do we live like this young man the servant with our eyes closed because what we see around us is not the presence of God because what we see around us are our difficulties the obstacles all our situations our hardships our, our, uh, our insurmountable mountains these are the things that our eyes see day in and day out therefore we live disappointed therefore we are fearful and anxious because our eyes are filled with these things but there, there should be times in times like these we should ask God God open my eyes that I can see your purposes that I can see you in the midst of the storm with me in the boat because when God opens our spiritual eyes then we will see him with us in every situation and the times that we cannot walk there have been many times in my life when I cannot I have not been able to walk and I have told God I said Lord I cannot walk through this I need you to carry me and you can be sure that God will carry you upon his wings like a mother eagle would carry her young on her wings because there is no way that God would ever ever leave us because he said I will never leave you I will never forsake you Lo, I will be with you unto the end of the age until this 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 world comes to an end he will be with you and me he will be with his saints he will be with his church he will never ever give up on us and yet we live lives where times that where we are more sorrowful than we are rejoicing because our eyes are not upon God and his power and his glory but the, but the word of God tells us something else in the book of Psalms I'm talking about Psalm 16 verse 11 it says you will show me the path of life if you ask God he will show you the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy 
at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I, I notice that the times when I am not sitting in his presence, I am not really seeking him out and I am not praying or looking into his word and clinging on to him, those are the times I am, I am without hope. But I know that there are the times when things can be going haywire around me. But when I look into his face and I stay connected to him, then I can be peaceful and I can be joyful. Because the word of God says that in his presence is fullness of joy. And you and I know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we have no joy in our hearts, we become like a, like a doll that's got all the sawdust out of it. All floppy and ready to give up. But when we are joyful, then we can leap over a wall and run through a troop. We can do anything because we know that he is by our side. When I titled my message, Living in His Presence, I'm talking about constantly looking into his face and wooing him into our life situations, chasing after him. When things become tough, continuing to battle with the powers of darkness and clinging on to God, even when you feel that the, that, that the earth beneath you is just giving, giving way. But you know that's a time for us to stand on the very words of God that says that we stand upon the rock and we will never be shaken. The uh, book of Acts chapter 3 verse 19, this is a beautiful, beautiful verse that I love. It says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When things are not working and when things are going, going the way that you don't want it to go, that's the time to make a U-turn. Time to come back. Come back to the Father's house because in the Father's house is always rejoicing. There is always food on the table. Because He will cause us to sit at His table. So times of refreshing come only when there is repentance. Times of refreshing comes only when we come into his presence. That is where we are refreshed and we can again stand up and get ready and run many miles knowing that God will always come through, that God is always our help, that he will never ever let us down. I'm going to read a beautiful passage that speaks about the presence of God. It's in the book of Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of, who, of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. It talks about Isaiah sitting in the temple. It is a year that King Uzziah had died. And everything was dark and dismal because King Uzziah was a very good, was a good king. Except at the end he kind of missed the mark. Otherwise he's the one who reinstated the worship in the temple. And it was a time when all the enemies were afraid, the Philistines were afraid of, of, the, of the Israelites. There was prosperity. He had reclaimed the, the desert lands around, around Israel. And, there was, you know, and, and he had made, made sure that he conserved a lot of water. There was irrigation. There, was, there were a lot of fields and a lot of agriculture was happening. And uh, Israel was enjoying peace from her enemies, because her enemies were afraid 
of King Uzziah and all the battle, the, the battle plan, the kind of implements that Uzziah had also, um, uh, he, like, kind of the, the things that he had kind of invented. Things like the, like maybe our, the catapult that we see today. All those things were used in warfare during Uzziah's time. So the enemies were petrified and terrified of the Israelites. They were enjoying great peace, great prosperity, and, and everybody was living in, in peace. And at that time, Uzziah dies. The end of it, you know, Uzziah becomes so high and lifted up. Where he goes and offers things that he can offer uh, incense in the, in the temple. And at that point of time, he's hit by leprosy. God's judgment comes upon Uzziah and he has to be kept in, he lives in isolation. And his son comes to the throne. But his son was not like Uzziah. And finally, when Uzziah dies, I, like all Israel is terrified. There's darkness in the land. They're afraid about the encroachment and the attack of enemies around. They're wondering what's going to happen to them. And at that time, Isaiah sees, because Isaiah the prophet, he sees this vision in the temple. And it, and it speaks to Isaiah's heart. He says, I saw the king, the great king, the king with the big K. The small king may have died. The, small, the king with the small K could have died. But the big king, the king of kings and the lord of lords was alive. And he saw God in his greatness. He saw God in his power. And when he saw God in his greatness, and he saw these angels, the seraphim, flying all around and the very temple shook. And they were crying out, there was smoke, and, they were, and, the, and the angels, and the seraphim, the angels were crying out, holy, holy, holy. When he saw God upon the throne, everything else, his vision of everything else changes. Because God wanted him to see him in his glory. In other words, to tell Isaiah, Isaiah, do not worry. Uzziah is a mere mortal. He, had, he lived, he died. You guys enjoyed prosperity and peace. But look to me. Because prosperity and peace and good times and times of refreshing and times of lifting up comes from me. Even today, we can be having a, a, a pandemic that is raging. Nothing seems to be ebbing out. Things seem to be uh, becoming worse. We keep hearing bad news constantly. When we look around, things may seem a little dismal, not little, very dismal and hopeless. And you're wondering what 2021 holds for you. But when you get into the presence of the Lord and see God high and lifted up in your life, if when you see him the way you really need to see him, then no matter what the situation is, no matter how difficult your situation might be, you know that there is a great king who will pull you up from the miry clay and set your feet upon a rock to stay and put in your mouth a new song to sing. Because God wants his people to be in, to always be above, never beneath. He always wants you and I to be like a city on a hill. Not people who are, who are hiding in a corner, afraid that something is going to happen to them. Because you and I are not creatures of chance. But we are people of, of destiny and whose destiny is written in God's book before the very foundations of the earth. And what is written is written. And nothing, no demon of hell or no situation on this earth can ever change your destiny and my destiny as long as we know how to live in his presence. Exodus 33, 14 says, the Lord the God tells Israel, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Even today, his presence goes before us. His omnipresence is all around us. 
His manifest presence every time we, we step into his manifest presence. When we press in and worship, when we read his word, when we pray, when we intercede, when we cry out, his manifest presence comes down. And things start changing. Our circumstances start changing. Those that seem to be shut will start opening. Everything will change in the presence of the Lord. You may ask me, is it possible to leave the presence of God? Today I'm going to tell you, you cannot get away from the omnipresence of God. Because God's presence is everywhere. But you can leave his manifest presence. And I'm going to show you that from scripture. Genesis chapter 4 verse 16. It's a story of, of Cain. Now God had warned Cain. He told Cain, Cain you have a bad attitude. Sin is crouching at your door. Do not give in to it. But we know the story how Cain went and killed his brother Abel because he was jealous of his brother Abel. And here verse 16 of Genesis 4 tells us. So God was angry with Cain and, and Cain was not ready to humble himself. And verse 16 says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Sometimes when we do not repent of our sin, because we know that there are that no man is perfect, there are times that we make mistakes, and the blood of Jesus, because in 1 John 1 9, we are told that if we confess our sins, He is just and faithful. To cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But there are times when, when we don't make U-turns and we continue going our own wayward ways. Where we do not want to make that U-turn and come back to God. And come back to dwell in fellowship with Him. And that is a time that we leave His presence. I'll show you another person who left His presence. That is the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. But, the ifs and the buts of the Bible are very important. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Deliberately, Jonah decides that he wants to leave the presence of the Lord. He doesn't want to do what God has asked him to do. How often we do the same thing. Times when we feel the Holy Spirit is telling us to maybe go some, go to go back to somebody and make peace with them and seek their forgiveness, we don't do it. When God has told us not to marry a, a, a spouse or, or take a spouse who doesn't love the Lord, who does, who's not a believer, we still go ahead and get married to an unbeliever. And expect God to just close his eyes and go along with your plan. When we don't walk the way that God wants us to walk. And when we live in deliberate sin and disobedience. To what we know to be his will. Then we leave his presence. We leave his manifest presence. Just like when God told Jonah. Go to Nineveh. He's quickly taking the opposite route and he decides that he wants to go to Tarshish and very clearly it says verse 3 but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord he doesn't want to listen to what God has to say he went to Joppa found a ship going to Tarshish 
So he paid the fare, he is continuing in his disobedience, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Then of course we know the story of how the, the ship was wrecked and Jonah was, stay, was swallowed by a huge whale and he stayed in the belly of the, of the whale, cried out to the Lord, repented of his sin and then God makes the whale spit him out and he goes to Nineveh. But it was a deliberate turning around and turning away. And many of us have lived, make this a constant lifestyle. Where we have no time to pray, no time to seek his face, no time to, like I said, to read his word, no time to get together uh, with other believers maybe to worship the Lord. Or if you cannot go at this time of, of uh, covid the coronavirus raging all around. You can just sit in your room and worship the Lord. Because when you worship the Lord, you go into his manifest presence. The very presence of God comes down. Because the word of God tells us in Psalm 22 verse 3. It says, but you are holy enthroned in the praises of Israel. God is enthroned in our praises and when we worship him, his manifest presence comes down. And when we live in that manifest presence, day in and day out, everything in our lives changes. Even the way that we look at ourselves changes. The way that we look at the world changes, everything changes when we are in the presence of the Lord. Psalm 95 verses 1 and 2, it talks about coming into his presence, coming into his manifest presence. It says, oh come let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. It talks about coming into his presence. And today I want to tell you that if you want to live in that manifest presence, you need to make worshipping worshiping God a lifestyle. You're the change the way that you live. Very often, we just grab our Bible and just read maybe a psalm or maybe even just one or two verses and then we just do a, a, a rushed time with him, just maybe just praying about a few things and then we are out. Just like we go, to the, go through a McDonald's drive-thru. Go drive-thru, just pick your burger and, and just drive out. It's the same with God. We just come hurriedly into, in there, just open the Bible, just read one or two verses and we are out through the door. And then we, then we are wondering why our lives, we live a life without his favor. Because I just read that it's only when you seek his presence and come to him with all your heart, will you and I have times of refreshing. Because times of refreshing come only from his hand. No other way. If you are thinking God knows my problem, He knows what I need, He is God, so let Him give me whatever I need to get. It doesn't work that way. It says you don't have because you don't ask. Because God has put in certain godly systems into our life. And one of, it, one of it is living in his presence, seeking his face. And verse 2 of Psalm 95, I, I again want to read the first part of it. It says, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. So every day, I mean, how could we ever start a day 
without being in his presence and worshiping him has to become a part of your life where you sit in his presence and listen to worship music or when you're driving in your car make it a practice to listen to worship music because when when you worship god the demons of power the demon powers of hell will flee as we praise and magnify our god psalm 100 verses 1 to 2 says make a joyful shout to the lord all you lands serve the lord with gladness come before his presence with singing so there so these two psalms even as you read you know that there is something called the presence the presence of god the manifest presence of god the concentrated presence of god And this happens when you make, an, make it intentional. When you decide that, yes, I'm going to enter his presence. Just like the people entered the tabernacle to worship the Lord and to offer sacrifices. The same way we need to make it a lifestyle to be in his presence, to live in his presence. Even maybe right through the day, turning your heart towards him several times, uttering small breath prayers and saying, God, I love you. My heart is set on you. Lord, I'm trusting you. Lord, I'm depending on you. Lord, I, I want to tell you that, I, that I, even though I'm sitting here, I still believe that I'm in your presence. Making this a hard attitude is what will bring times of refreshing into your life and my life. So let us pray and say, God, open our eyes that we see you and your greatness and your power and your splendor and not be blindsided by the things that are happening around us. Because God has the ability to change any situation and to come through no matter how dark and how dismal your circumstance may be. He is God and there's nothing that is too hard for him. So let us practice living in his presence and wooing him and chasing after him and inviting his favor over our lives and living in his presence means fullness of joy for you and me where you and I are comforted because we read in the book of Zephaniah that he sings songs over us he sings songs over his people he rejoices over us with singing. And we are asked to rejoice and sing in his presence. So let's make this a lifestyle. May the Lord bless his word. And may it change the way that we live. And I pray that you and I will stand under his abundant rain of blessing and his showers of refreshing over your life and my life. God bless you. I invite the worship team to lead us in the last song. Thank you.
Hallelujah. I'll give the benediction and we'll close. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. In the name of the Almighty Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray and all the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a good week. And we'll meet again next Saturday at 7 p.m. And we'll have another uh, time of worship and of sharing the word. Do tell your friends and neighbors and whoever you can to uh, uh, key in and you know to the Facebook. You can uh, be with us because we do this every Saturday at 7 p.m. God bless you. Have a great week ahead. Thank you. Good night.